Ladies and gentlemen, the Shred Gaming Tentacom video, we're going to be discussing a recent interview with Mark Cerny. And in it, he was discussing on just how developers are going to find the PlayStation 4 hardware in three or four years' time. In other words, they're going to be able to become a lot more familiar and they're going to be able to get much more out of it. So this interview was actually conducted in Gamescom 2013, but has just been put up. So we're going to be reading out the interview and then we're going to be doing some analysis of it. So with that said, um, let's get started. Uh, the quote begins, we set our target at 10 times the PlayStation 3's performance because that's what we felt we needed to achieve in order to differentiate the titles. When I did the pitches to developers about the hardware, I talked about what I call the Akihabara test. Uh, side uh, note, I'm not exactly sure on the pronunciation of that. I'm going to give you guys the spelling. That would be A K I H A. B A R A. Uh, Akihabara is an electronics district in Tokyo, and it's just full of stores where you can buy just about anything you plug into a wall socket. I knew at some point that they'd be out on the sidewalk a PlayStation 3 and a PlayStation 4, and they might even be showing the same game. And the PlayStation 4 had to be powerful enough that when people walk by, they had to look at the PlayStation 4 and say, Wow, I have to have that. I believe we are at that level of performance. I mean, the millions of pre-orders we have, I think, speak of that. Believe it or not, at the PlayStation 3's launch, I was hearing a lot about how the PlayStation 3 graphics aren't really that different from the PlayStation 2. I think that speaks to how large people's expectations are, and also how launch titles are not fully exploiting the hardware. Once again, Mark Cerny pointed out it's a supercharged PC architecture, so you can use it as if it was a PC with unified memory. Much of what we're seeing at launch titles is the usage. It's very, very quick to get up to speed on how to use it, but at the same time, then you're not taking advantage of all the customization we did to the GPU. I think that really will play in the graphical quality of level interaction in the world and say, year three or four of the console end quote for now so this is kind of a debate that's been raging on for a long time and i think it's kind of one of those things that's as old as gaming itself as the level of detail also known as lod in games begins to increase there becomes this problem where we find it a lot harder to really notice the difference between generations of graphics if you're not exactly sure what I'm talking about, look at, let's say, the 8-bit to the 16-bit era. I'm going to let you guys Google on specs on your own time. I'm not going to fill up the video with it. But we were talking about, you know, just over 60 colors. And that was like the full range of the palette available, by the way, uh, for developers in the 8-bit era. And then, of course, we get into the thousands of colors in the 16-bit era. And then, of course, we get into millions of colors in the 32-bit era. And then it continues. But if you look at the difference between, say, the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2, uh, let's even talk about the launch titles of those games you're going to see quite a disparity. In my personal opinion, one of the best examples of this is the PlayStation 3. I use the PlayStation 3 because I like to pick on it, if you will, and I use that with massive quotation marks, not because um, any other reason other than it's one of the best examples of a console that was really difficult to utilize fully. It had a very, very large barrier for entry in terms of knowledge because of its architecture. That's common knowledge. Like the Sony guys have admitted that. Uh, there was numerous issues, including bad tool chains, uh, difficult to utilize hardware, and goodness knows what else. And you'll notice over time that as the developers, especially their own first party developers, of course, that would be like Santa Monica, um, Naughty Dog, for example, as they become familiar with the hardware, you can see definite jumps. One of the biggest ones, in my personal opinion anyway, 
was like the really early ones to say Uncharted 1 and Uncharted 2. Uncharted 1 looked pretty damn good, but the lighting effects in Uncharted 2 were... They were damn well impressive. And Uncharted 2, to let's say Naughty Dog's latest outing on the PlayStation 3, of course The Last of Us, it's profound the level of detail and differences in terms of the large open areas, how smooth everything runs, the frame rates and everything else. You wouldn't really think that the PlayStation 3, if you saw that at launch, you wouldn't think it was capable. So what happens, of course, is as you begin to get far higher, denser polygon counts, as shadows become a lot better, as lighting effects become better. Uh, this is actually a common complaint, uh, especially in terms of sound. Like most people, for example, they don't actually have the audio equipment hooked up to their systems good enough to be able to even um, show off the really cool sound effects in a lot of games. Like Most people don't have, for example, 7.1 surround sound systems with really good ranges in terms of you know, what they can actually put out. And so really, really, really focusing on that in games is a bit tricky. The same thing, by the way, has even been said with Mark, uh, I'm sorry, John Carmack, not Mark Cerny, that's what you get for speaking about so many people's names, but um, John Carmack, who is, of course, uh, pretty well known in the gaming development uh, circles, he was recently giving his own speeches, and um, he was saying that, look, the problem is a lot of developers, they start getting really fixated on things such as lighting. And lighting, as it turns out, is not a small, um, insular little topic. There's actually developers who put their whole lives into improving the lighting in engines, because lighting is huge. There's physics involved in it, there's goodness knows what else involved in it, and it's, of course, dynamic. Lighting now is becoming a lot better, um, a lot more powerful. And lighting in scene has an absolute huge implication on the mooding, the mood lighting of the scene. So, for example, you know, a corridor, a well-lit corridor doesn't look particularly scary, but a little change in ambient lighting, a nice little bit of audio effects, and suddenly it becomes a whole lot less of a walk in the park. My point being that there gets to a point, however, with this lighting where it actually becomes almost lost in as John was saying, the difference is in the ability of your screen. So, for example, you may have a piss-poor configured screen, or you may have a brilliantly configured screen. If you have a piss-poor configured screen, and by which I mean bad color balance, bad contrast levels, whatever, maybe your screen's just old, maybe it just has a bad range of contrast or whatever, then a lot of the time, the really subtle differences in lighting uh, the developers can be tempted to work on becomes lost. Now, in the PlayStation 3, uh, or say the PlayStation 4 element, the basic premise behind the whole design was: look, we want the design to be really easy to use. They decided to have one memory pool, um, which of course has 256-bit bus, which delivers 176 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Um, has 5500 megahertz RAM. If you're curious about how all that works, I have just released a video on that, so you can check that out. Um, and the whole purpose behind this is it gives you a large, fast memory pool to be able to pull the resources together, and you can utilize that with a pretty damn reasonable CPU. Well, a good CPU configuration anyway, and a pretty damn powerful GPU configuration, which, of course, has eight ACEs. Uh, ACE and synchronous compute engines, in other words, for compute, which of course can be used for physics and goodness knows what else, and graphics technology, of course, which are the 18 GCN cores, uh, graphics core next, and that all puts out about 1.840 flops of computing power. Now, we, we do know that the PlayStation 4 will likely grow over time in terms of resources available. We know that Sony have a flexible memory system. I have gone into this heavily in other videos. I'm not going to cover it too much in this video because it's a very lengthy topic. But suffice to say, they have what's known as flexible memory. But um, most likely, they're going to give away more memory to developers in the future. They're not going to have the 
the about I think it's about three gigabytes um, allocated to operating system resources. It's no longer going to be that most likely in the future. They're going to change this, of course, uh, depending on what their needs are. Similarly, we can possibly even expect things such as a GPU overclock or upclock. It's just unknown. My point being, however, that the console will grow over time. And right now, a lot of developers, when they're starting to get their feet wet with the PlayStation 4, there's two different ways they can really uh, code on the system. The first is low-level access to the hardware. That basically means that they're going to really have to be familiar with the coding libraries and so on, and Sony do give them a decent smattering, but they're really going to have to be familiar with them. Um, a lot of it is using C++ and derivatives thereof. If you're familiar with that, if you're comfortable with that, if you understand how all the hardware works, you can get much better performance because you don't have the CPU overhead or for the second one, which is the higher layer. Now, the higher layer basically codes a lot of this stuff, well, not codes, but handles a lot of the stuff for you. Basically, X is an interpreter. Um, Basic simplifying it, it basically just hides a lot of the functionality, hides a lot of the raw, um, you have to know this stuff, and just does it for you. Um, and it can have some benefits, actually. It can get you up and running very quickly, which is really handy for indie developers. For example, let's say that you are an indie developer. You don't have particularly high demand in terms of the graphics, a lot of indie games, for example, because obviously artists are really expensive. We know Electronic Arts and even uh, Microsoft themselves have said that one of the biggest costs right now isn't actually programmers. It's actually the graphics artists because there are so many. And remember, the graphics artists aren't just ones who you know, design a couple of characters. They will do everything. They will do everything from making the trees in a game all the way down to gun textures, to the walls, to the ceilings, to whatever else. And think about just how many areas in a game there are. And of course, I even have to sketch this stuff out a lot of the time. Level design, all of it is really expensive stuff. And it's just not really feasible, actually, is what it comes down to for a lot of indies to do that. And it's not judging them. It's just a fact. You cannot expect them to be able to put out you know, levels of detail that high, um, especially if it's just, you know, a couple of people working on it, even if they're using, say, Unreal Engine, uh, which does give you a good helping hand if you're using, say, UDK. But most of the time they are doing, you know, stylistic graphics. They're going like a very cool style, for example, Limbo or whatever. And when they, of course, become a, big, a bigger studio, I'm sorry, then it's a bit different. Then they can hire more artists. My point being, however, with lower graphical um, fidelity, what they can basically do is they can use the, the higher level API. And that's very good for them. So later on, however, for studios such as EA or Bethesda or whomever else, as they become more familiar with the titles and as they become more familiar with the hardware and as they become more comfortable with the hardware, and this is especially going to become into its own when they no longer have to be tied into engines which are going to be compatible with, say, the PlayStation 3. We no longer are needing to worry about, well, we have to worry about appealing to the lowest common denominators, in this case the PS3, the Xbox 360, which of course are legions behind the current, well, the next generation of consoles and of course PC development as well. Um, it's going to be a case where they can really start to bury their heads into the, the code and really optimize this stuff, so I, I completely agree. Mark, of course, has been, and Mark Cerny has been very, very keen to push compute, and of course, uh, Sony have done numerous changes on that, such as the volatile bit for the level 2, uh, direct access to the GPU with one of the buses, in fact, an additional bus as well, uh, as well as numerous other changes that I'm not going to bother to mention because I've waxed lyrically on them previously. If you're f unfamiliar with them, then by golly gosh, you can check out the various series on RGT, that's this very channel. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you found it somewhat of an interesting video. Um, 
I don't think this is anything particularly new to anyone. I think many people knew this anyway, in terms of hardware grows over time. But I think it's nice to hear a little bit of perspective on it from Mark and his team. So anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I will see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.